This StarCast show, just like all of our StarCast shows, are available at adfreeshows.com. So you mentioned Philadelphia, and obviously the energy of the fans defined ECW and made stars. It made you, Rob, during a time period where you were kind of like Sabu's guy, but you weren't being pushed, and the fans kind of demanded that. And then we come to the night in Asbury Park, New Jersey, at Living Dangerously, where you guys are wrestling for the television title, goes to a 20-minute draw. The referee, I think it was John Finnegan, says, no, we're going to restart it and continue on. And the crowd over the course of this starts chanting, new effing show. Obviously, you're the whole effing show. And it changes Jerry's whole career forever and gives you a different dimension. I got to ask, that's going on in the ring. And obviously, there's a million things going on in your head while you're having the match. But you can hear some of the crowd at times. When that, when that chant starts coming up, I'm curious what each of your reaction is. Because that's like one of those, the crowd makes the moment, the crowd makes the star. Well, I'll never forget it because I remember I was climbing up the turnbuckle and I, a whole corner of the building started chanting it. And in my entire career, I could never think of a weird, wacky showbiz name for me or anything like that. And I just thought it was a cool moment because the fans gave me the name, you know, and... Uh, you were knighted. <laughs> right. You were. But What are your memories of that, Rob? I'm trying to remember if that was my idea to call him the new heaven show. Um, I know that I wanted that, so my thoughts are, cool, this is working. I mean, I was... I wanted always to build Jerry up to because I liked wrestling with him. He was a, a great opponent, but time after time after time, I was always winning. So I used to say to Paul, "Hey, you know, we gotta, you know, we gotta give him some credibility here so that you know we can keep, you know, keep some uh, steam going with this match." And so I, you know, I was pushing for you know giving him a W, and, and I was behind the new F and show. I don't. If I'd have known that when they were going to award me the belt, I'd have taken it and left. <laughs> <laughs> well, the feud was built around the ECW World Television Championship, which when you held it, Rob, it was as important as the ECW World title was. Talk a little bit about, you know, that belt being important during the rivalry. And you talk about, you know, you were, you were pushing for Jerry to get the win. What was it like with trying to push your vision of what you guys wanted for your matches when Paul has his vision? And how often did it intersect or go in different directions? I just realized I forgot to bring the fucking ECW TV title. Oh. I know. All right, we're going to stop the show. Everybody come back in <laughs> 20 minutes. <laughs> um, we'll CGI it in later. I, I just totally was like, fuck, I meant to bring that. Um, can you repeat that? I was spaced. World television title. Uh, obviously, you guys, the, that was the crux of the feud for a long time. You were talking about you were pushing for Jerry to get the win, which eventually you do get the win at some point over the feud. Um, talk about what it was like when you guys had your vision of what you wanted to do and pushing for things that you might want that Paul Heyman didn't. Obviously, he was the booker, it was his company. How often were, 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 were their heads butting in that regard in terms of creative? There really wasn't. Paul just gave us so much freedom. We were able to go out there and do what we wanted. I think the only one time we had the match at the, the arena in Philly, and that's when I had the ribs taped. And we were supposed to wrestle, but they did the gimmick where the impact players jumped me and I was sent to the hospital. So you wrestled, I forget it was Lance or Justin. And then uh, they started dummying you. I hit the ring to help and blah, blah, blah. And as I'm leaving, you challenged me and said, the people came here to see an RVD match. You said, come cool. Yeah, and you said, come on in here and uh, let me kick your ass. <laughs> so I was like, okay. <laughs> you know? But that night, when I went back to the ring and we were wrestling, the crowd just was, un they just came unglued for everything. And uh, we did a spot in the match. It, we didn't move the table, we didn't touch a table, and it was just an impromptu clothesline off the apron through the table, so it was a complete surprise. And they were carting me off, and I stopped, I shoved them all off, and I came back and we finished. And after that, they were blowing the roof off the place. And I'll never forget, after one of the false finishes, uh, we're laying there right next to each other, and, and you said, oh, effing awesome. And I said, we got them. Mm -hmm. And I'll never forget that night. To, to me, that was one of my favorite matches with you just because of how we had the fans like this, and it was just an amazing moment. It's like one of those, it's the drug of the business. On nights like that, you cannot get to sleep till 5, 6 in the morning. Yeah, definitely uh, fun times. I don't remember butting heads with Paul too often. He was very encouraging in the right ways, and if there was something he didn't think 
was a good idea, you know, then, then he would like, he would let you know, I, I don't think that's a good idea. And he would, you know, you know, eh, you don't need to do this. You know, like he would, but he would, there was never, you know, like, no, Paul, I'm not, I don't like the way that you said it. I believe otherwise. I don't, I mean, it might have happened, but if it was, it was not often at all. It was, usually, it was usually just trading ideas back and forth. Well, how about if we, blah, blah, you know, it wasn't really a... But right, but, but Paul was, uh, was so good at um, encouraging the strengths of the talent, yeah. um, you know, of everybody, you know, hiding their weak spots and really um, allowing the, the wrestlers to grow and, um, and be prospectively, you know, superstars, at least, in, at least the, the tools, you know, uh, to be superstars and... One time, this was like right after I beat Bam Bam Bigelow for the TV title. Did you guys see that? Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah. Buffalo, New York. <laughs> um, and, and the very next show that I worked on was in Queens, and I was wrestling Mikey Whipwreck. And, um, and I was just, my, normally I would always try and think of new shit, things I haven't seen, things I haven't done. And so I was just, before the show started, I was in the arena and Paul walked by and I was like, Paul, what do you think about this? I want to take Mikey and uh, crotch him on the guardrail on the walkway down to the ring. And then I want to springboard off the other guardrail and go across the, the walkway and like kick, kick him off. And Paul goes, I don't think it matters what you do. They're going to love you. And I was like... <laughs> That sounds like... Yeah, and I was like... No, I mean, like, maybe if Fonzie hold the chair, he goes, whatever you want. They're going to be... They're going to love everything you do tonight. And I didn't know what he... I didn't know why he was saying that, but he was absolutely right. Like, that was so pivotal. That night, I was a superstar, like, on a whole nother level, and, you know, never went back down. But after I got the TV title, all the fans treated me uh, different in that from that, that night in 98, whenever it was. Hey, hey, it's Conrad Thompson. Thanks for checking out the podcast here on YouTube. Be sure to hit the subscribe button and the notifications bell so you get a notice anytime we upload some new content. And go save yourself some money right now. If you're in a 30-year loan or you have credit card debt, it's not a matter of if I can save you money. It's a matter of how much. Find out right now for free at SaveWithConrad.com.